Okay, thank you. Um, good evening and welcome to the Hong Kong U Main Library, our special collections. Uh, I think this might be a first for many of you because there are not many familiar faces. We run these uh, book club events uh, around eight to ten times every year. Uh, this is a particularly unusual one as we have uh, a moderator, a single moderator, as we always do, but we have actually six authors. Uh, so it's really not just a book talk, it's actually an author's talks. So um, we're very pleased for this special occasion and it's uh, uh, the second that we've had this year. So this is, of course, uh, these, are, these authors are, of course, uh, winners of the Proverse International uh, prize for unpublished writing and Gillian uh, Bickley is uh, the co-founder of uh, that prize and she is this evening's moderator so I you know I because we have six people I'm not going to say much more so leave it to Gillian thank you thank you very much Peter so good evening everyone thank you very much for coming I'm delighted that the University of Hong Kong Libraries Book Club ha has given me the opportunity to tell you something about the Provost Prize for Unpublished Writing, and also given some of those who successfully entered for the prize a chance to tell you a little about the manuscripts that they entered for the prize, now published books. I'm particularly grateful to the university librarian, Peter Sudorko, and to Gary Chin, Public Relations and Development Manager, University Libraries, and his team. The Provost Prize was founded in 2008 as an annual competition with the objective of encouraging writers and promoting a range of excellence and usefulness in writing. The first competition took place in 2009. I'd like you to meet my husband, Werner Bickley, co-founder of the Provost Prize. <clears throat> Without his support, the prize could never have been set up. Werner was founding director of the Institute of Language and Education of the Hong Kong government and an assistant director of education. He's now chairman of the English Speaking Union in Hong Kong. The regulations of most literary prizes in the world rule out many people. Entrants may need to be of a certain nationality, place of residence, age, or gender. They may need to be published writers, or they may need to be unpublished writers, etc. The Provost Prize competition is open to all. The only stipulation is that entrants should be a minimum of 18 years old on the date they sign the entry documents. There are, uh, there are few restrictions also as to the type of writing. It can be fiction, for example, novels, novellas, short story collections, non-fiction, for example, autobiography, biography, essay collections, journals, memoirs, diaries, letters, or poetry. The entered work does need to be submitted in English, but it can be a translation into English. The prize is publication by Provis Hong Kong, a Hong Kong-based publishing entity with worldwide distribution, plus a cash prize of 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, which may be shared by at most two people. A small number of publication prizes may also be given according to the standard of entries in any year. Maybe some of you are thinking, I could enter for that prize. Why not? You're welcome to do so. The handout that's going around just now has information about how to enter, and so does the Provis website. And the address is at the end of the handout. In the handout, there are details of those who've entered so far. You can see there's been an international representation from people of all ages over 18 and of different walks of life. Several people living in Hong Kong have achieved success in this international competition 
and have had their varied work published through the Provis Prize. Subsequently, they've been recognized elsewhere in the literary and book worlds in a variety of ways. We have the pleasure of meeting some of them tonight and hearing six of them introduce the work they entered for the prize. But first, I'm going to introduce some of the successful writers who come to meet you, but who will not be speaking from the platform, but some of their books are on the table. And could you stand up when I call your name? So Akin JJ, his book is a poetry collection. <laughs> Smoked Pearl, Poems of Hong Kong and Beyond. Emily Ho, Emily. <laughs> and her book is Memoirs of an Ice Cream Lady. Now we all like ice cream. Catherine Jang, Catherine. <laughs> and her book is Myla the Magician, a bilingual book, and Catherine wrote both the English and the Chinese text, which I understand is very unusual indeed. It's a very readable book. Victor, who's just arrived in the nick of time. <laughs> Victor, Victor Apps, he wrote something with a lot of peas. The Perilous Passage of Princess Petunia Peasant. And each of the chapters begins with a P. Now that took some doing. Have I missed anybody out who's not sitting here? Also present is Andrew Guthrie, who's going to stand up for two reasons now. Andrew. <laughs> he entered a poetry collection, Alphabet, and he was a finalist in the 2013 competition. His book will be published shortly on 9th of April at an evening event to be held in central Hong Kong. I'd also like to introduce two, I can only see one at the moment, two of the four finalists for the Provost Prize 2014. Celia Klasser, Celia. <coughs> Celia entered a work of philosophical essays and poetry. Um, Philip Chatting, I think, has not arrived yet. Okay, so one more will come. The other two finalists, Jan Pearson and Ginny McRobert, each live in Australia, so they're not here tonight. They entered novels. The winners of the Provost Prize 2014 will be announced at the, at the same evening, 9th of April, that I've mentioned already. I'm now going to call upon the six speakers, one by one, of course, to introduce their books to you. Um, we've got a brief to be quite short, but there will be a question and answer session at the end. So if you want, want to ask any or all of them a question, please make a note and remember to ask it at the end. And there are some details in the handout. So, Rebecca. So Rebecca Tomasis was a joint, don't worry, I'll get it, joint winner at the, of the inaugural prize, thank you so much, in 2009. Her book is called Mishpaha, Family. It, family is a translation of the first word. And it's a story of four women living together as wives of one man, in the modern state of Israel. Okay, Rebecca. Come and uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rebecca Tomasis, and uh, Mishpacha fa Family uh, is my first novel. It won the inaugural Proverse Prize in 2009, and then was published by Proverse in 2010. Um, how did my novel come about? Um, I was extremely fortunate after the birth of my first child um, to have the time to not only start to write the novel, um, but we did a lot of traveling between Hong Kong and Israel. Um, so we basically spent a year uh, living between the, the two countries uh, with my husband and my, my baby son. Um, uh, Israel is as much the subject of my book as anything else. Um, Israel is a fascinating country uh, filled with immense history 
Um, amazing people, places, food. It's just an incredibly, incredibly um, inspiring place to be. Um, and it's an incredibly um, inspiring place for me to be. Um, and it was and is continues to be a place that, that, that fant fascinates me um, continuously. Um, and it's really a place that I've grown to love. And it just it just became the, the natural and most perfect place for the setting of my, uh, for my first novel. Um, as a woman and now as a mother, uh, women and their need to find their place in society uh, and themselves within their own lives um, continues to be a theme of great significance to me in my writing. Um, for whatever reason, I, I think women, we live our lives preoccupied with uh, finding meaning within our own lives and um, seeking out the reasons for why we do or don't do certain things. Um, as women, we are all incredibly diverse, and yet we're all looking for that meaning. Um, and I believe that when women come together, we are incredibly strong, um, and that we should draw on that strength to, uh, to inspire each other rather than fight against each other. Um, all women deserve a voice and deserve the chance to find their voice. Um, and I help, hope my novel does that, not just allows my characters to do that, but perhaps readers also. Um, this is the time where I, where I thank the Provost Prize. I think if it hadn't been for the Provost Prize, my novel may never have been finished. Um, basically, the deadline for submitting applications to the Provost Prize was what drove me to finish it. Um, having a deadline helped. I think otherwise it would have probably gone on forever. Um, I spent a year working on it, rewriting it, um, leading it down ways and paths that I wasn't sure ever had an end. So thank you, Gillian. Um, and so I remain grateful to Proverse for letting my novel see the light of day. And I hope everybody enjoys it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So now, Rupert Chen. Rupert was a finalist in 2009. His book is Chocolate's Brown Study in the Bag. Now, is he a toy or a miniature poodle? Toy. A toy poodle. So in his book, a toy poodle tells the story of its life, but through doing so, also the life of the writer. So Rupert. <laughs> Thank you. Um, first of all, I must clarify one thing, because if you look at the book, you see my picture on the front cover. No, I'm not an uh, egomaniac. I did not choose that picture. It's an editorial decision to overrule the one I suggested, the uh, picture of chocolate himself. It now goes to the back cover, I understand, from the editor. Uh, that picture violated some British law, which I don't quite follow. I can understand nudity being banned, but uh, she assured me it's something quite the opposite. So uh, uh, I can't explain to you what I myself don't understand, so I better revert to my text. Good evening, everybody. When I attended a Provers publishing event in 2011, I talked about my book that had just been published in March that year, exactly four years ago. This is what I said on that occasion, and I quote myself. Chocolate's brown study in a bag is the autobiography of Chocolate, my pet toy poodle, when he was 33 months old back in 2009. I entered the inaugural Provost Prize competition and got into the shortlist with this manuscript. Gillian and Werner graciously helped me put it in print as a Provost publication in March that year. Uh, this book is, for me, both a labor of love and an ode to joy, since I genuinely feel that it is a blessing to have chocolate in our family as an inexhaustible source of joy, end of quote. That explains why I wrote this book, to share with my readers the love and joy that chocolate brought to my family and my life. I also touched briefly on how I did it by calling it not biography, but autobiography of chocolates. I acted not as Boswell to his Johnson, but 
as mere stenographer scribe, putting down in writing what he narrated as the story of the first 33 months of his own life. Chocolate is the hero in the first person. It is I sense this, I do that, I think this, I declare that. Uh, there is a grand sounding term for such a technique called anthropomorphism. I endow the animal protagonist with characteristics and abilities of a human being. And in so doing, I fictionalized what was a real life story so that chocolate may have close to omniscience and photographic memory. He recalls what I said about my past accurately. He understands every word we said and draws his own conclusions or makes witty remarks on our follies, foibles, and fiascos. It is an expedient that enables me to compress a family history into a dog's triennium. And this is not too far-fetched. According to Chocolate's teacher at Obedience School, a toy poodle with above-average intelligence among canines could easily master a vocabulary of 300 words. In Chocolate's case, that is a bilingual vocabulary of English and Cantonese, since the medium of instruction at obedience school was English. And uh, Eleanor, my uh, Filipina domestic helper, lectures him daily, also in English, and the rest of the family talked to him in both English and Cantonese. In the book, I recorded a real-life incident when I was strolling with chocolate on the peak and I was asked by mainland Chinese tourists what was his name and I answered Chiao Ke Li and when they started calling him that he failed to recognize his own name because that's in a third dialect he had not mastered and that I think covers how, how I wrote the book and uh, now I will give you an update the book ends in June 2009 when my elder son was preparing for marriage and my younger son for transfer to Singapore. Both events did take place later that year and I had my gallbladder out in between those two more significant events. And now my wife and I are both retirees and Chocolate is now eight years old which converts to 56 in human age. So Chocolate and I are both getting on and getting long in our teas, although in my case it's literal uh, and it's due to recession of the gum. Chocolate is still an inexhaustible source of joy and looks and acts just as young and spry and boyish as he was in the book. He just seems to have inexhaustible energy. Uh, as an illustration, my wife Helena, on retirement, acquired a new skill and hobby of photography. And here is her prize-winning picture featuring chocolate jumping over me, reclining on the lawn. It's a telling picture of our difference in vicar. Helena got second prize and said uh, she would have got first if Chocolate had had a more presentable uh, extra or, or supporting actor. And Chocolate masters his 300-word vocabulary now, not just in listening comprehension. He talks. And uh, I would say just like the Umbrella Movement youngsters, he literally demands dialogue with us. He makes sounds that may be distinguished as whines, whimpers, and moans, besides the natural canine barks, growls, and yaps. And he makes such sounds when he welcomes us home, laments our going out without him, or asks to share our snacks. And he croons to tunes being played on a piano by my kids that tickled his fancy. And uh, in fact, I have a, re a video recording of his rendering of a song, Beauty and the Beast, on my iPhone, if anyone is interested in watching it later. 
I tried anthropomorphism in writing my book, and now the hero of that book genuinely considers himself a human being and demands to have dialogue with us in a common language. So, who knows, one of these days he may actually dictate the sequel to this old book. So watch this space. But what I would like to share with you here is mainly the very pure and simple love and joy recorded in this book. When I wrote it, I put my own heart in it. And every time I reread it, I still relive those moments of bliss we shared with chocolate as a baby pub. Everything is unchanged. I'm uh, indebted to Provost Publishing for enabling me to tell my happy story to the world. Now that they are talking about the happiness index in Hong Kong falling so low, I believe reading a happy dog's life story will be spiritually uplifting and who knows, we mere humans can learn from him the secret of sustained happiness in life. You can learn that by enrolling in the uh, course in uh, the Buddhist study center, but uh, reading the book is, I think, a quicker way. So most delighted to share our bliss. Be my guest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rupert. One of the things Rupert says in the book is that dogs do things that make them happy again and again and again, and they don't get bored. So he feels that's the secret of happiness, to do things that, that you enjoy again and again. Thank you very much. And the next speaker is James Tam, um, who was a finalist in 2011. His book is Man's Last Song. In 2090, the human race faces imminent extinction. Hong Kong survivors face the challenge. Thanks, Julia. You're not supposed to give away spoilers, Julia. I know. Um, well, thank you for letting us here to discuss our books. Uh, I think today's weather is perfect for me to introduce the man's last song. Uh, by, I, I think by far the most frequent question I get is uh, what the story is, what's the story about? I never get any questions such as uh, where can I buy a copy? Uh, but since I have seven minutes, I'm going to spend a couple of them on telling you what the book is not about before I tell you what it is because if I have too much time, I tend to also give away spoilers. Uh, well, first of all, Man's Last Song is commonly classified as science fiction. Uh, just because I think there's only one reason, because the story is set in the future. Uh, but to me, it actually reflects a strange mentality in us. Uh, not e because not everything that happens in the, in the future is, is, fiction, uh, is fiction, right? Because in, it's quite the opposite. Everything that happens in the future depends on what we do today. Uh, it's a simple cause and effect. But uh, all the books are now required to have a genre in the modern world, just like ID cards. So, so Man's Last Song is, I think, it's officially, is it officially science fiction to booksellers. Uh, and a, a guy called Dan Bloom, a, he coined it, the term uh, climate fiction, cli-fi. He insists that uh, Man's Last Song is cli-fi. I kind of agree with him, but act, uh, actually in my heart, I. I really believe not all books should have a genre, and Man's Last Song is one of them. Uh, secondly, uh, although it's a story about the end of the world, it's not dystopian. Uh, <coughs> it, it, does it sound contradictory? I, I, I don't think so, because according to science, religion, everyone tells us that the world is ending. It's only a matter of time. So. If we, if a story about the wor the, end, the world coming to an end is dystopian, that means uh, everything is dystopian from the onset, which is probably true. Uh, well, my actually uh, that's a personal story, but uh, I don't I don't think Mark would mind. Uh, a very good friend of mine, my best friend from high school in Canada, uh, <coughs> uh, had given me one of the most heartening testimonials. Uh, 
uh, he's been he's been di diagnosed with depression. I'm quite sure it's a wrong diagnosis, but he doesn't think so because he paid the doctor. Because uh, uh, my friend is very funny and a very nice guy, uh, except that maybe he's too nice. He worries a bit too much. Maybe then the doctor think, well, you know, you're too nice. You must be depressed. Um, so, but anyway, he, he told me after he read the book that he felt liberated. You know, I mean that's a very big word for reading my story. Uh, but I should tell him that he's he's nice, he's funny, but he's he also tends to exaggerate. That's why we are very good friends for so long, living in different cities. Uh, okay, now maybe a few words on what the book, what the story is, is about. Uh, Man's last song is set in the future, but but actually it's mostly about its past, which is our present. Uh, then it's about life, death love, friendship, you know, uh, and the human conditions, the same inevitable ingredients for all the stories, except, uh, except yours, it was about dogs, right? Yeah. So, uh, in uh, 2090, basically after decades of universal sterility, the human, human race is dying out. The youngest man alive, uh, his name is Song Sang, like a song is sung, He's a Hong Kong Eurasian. Uh, he's already 42 years old and he's the youngest man around. Uh, universal sterility might sound a bit drastic, but uh, as uh, one of the protagonists points out, the fact that we all exist, it's extremely unlikely in the universe. But it happened, and once it's happened, uh, extinction is inevitable. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, that's the only outcome eventually. If it's not because of it, it's not it be because of that. <coughs> Actually, according to a recent article, I mean recent, just a couple of weeks ago, I read it in the New Scientist. Europe is full of dying countries, if not because of immigration. Uh, Italy had a seventeen percent; it had seventeen percent more death than birth in two thousand one four, and with a birth rate of one point two nine women, it's actually at the brink of non-renewal, and and uh, and Italy is not alone. So it's actually not that far-fetched. Uh, uh, but in the book, I actually have offered a couple of uh, amateurish scientific speculation on why it might happen. But that's not the main theme of the book, not of the story. But actually, it is a very possible scenario. <coughs> Excuse me. But whatever the cause, um, general infertility has created a great dilemma. You think about it, the human world approaches the end because there's no more babies. Forget about the reason why. When there's no more babies, it causes a panic. But in reality, if you work it out, work out the population, how it evolved, we would remain overpopulated for decades. With the whole society just get older and older. Every age, age goes to 70 something. And what do we do? I think unlike uh, most end of the world drama, uh, which goes with a lot of bangs, a lot of you know uh, noise, uh, mine I, I predict that uh, actually the world would be largely the same because we don't know that many of us, billions of us, wouldn't know how to function or survive. You know, uh, uh, we can't get out of this rut. So everyone has to do the exact same thing, except that we don't retire. We keep going and getting older until one day we reach, uh, we, we fall below the critical mass. Then we would stop, uh, we, ca we can't afford to generate electricity, supply water and so on anymore. Of course there'll be no more Medicare and then, then the world would change. So by, the two, by 2090 that the world has changed to that state. Uh, uh, the, so the leftovers would be living a Stone Age lifestyle. There may be a few thousand, I speculate, there may be a few thousand left in Hong Kong. Imagine this city. Just close your eyes and think of all the buildings that we have. But only a few thousand people left in Hong Kong. And uh, they farm and gather, and maybe occasionally, the young men, you know, like 42, he's young, young and rebellious and adventurous. He might uh, find an old can of spam and, and try it, you know, uh, expired 20 years ago. Uh, and some of the neighbors may start to expire and with no one to take care of them. And they become more, I've done some research, they actually in that case they become more slippery than stiff. And they require proper disposal because before the dogs get to them. And dogs, the best men, I mean, I mean the best, uh, best friends of uh, humans, 
actually would be uh, vying for a favorable position on the new food chain, you know, which we now sit on the top and eat by default. But I think the dogs would think very differently under a different situation when there's only a few thousand of us left. Um, it might, de it might demand, demand more than dialogues. It might want to eat you. And, uh, <coughs> and also, without medicine, uh, there's a Song Sang's father, for example, an old man would start thinking. Without Medicare, in a, in a, in a, under those circumstances, if anything happened to him, he would become an insufferable burden to his son. So he decided to do something. Uh, and but unlike their Stone Age ancestors, these postmodern, I call them postmodern savages, they have knowledge, they know a lot more than real Stone Age men, and they have uh, secure shelters everywhere. You know, uh, the, the, the price of real estate in Hong Kong at, uh, would, would have finally fallen to zero because you can go live in, you can go live on the peak every, anywhere you want. Uh, and, but they have plenty of time because they have with all these uh, provisions and some a lot left over from the past. So, including the best cognac, you know, Armagnac, Cavados, whatever. So, when people have a lot of time and drinks are free, they tend to talk a lot. They tend to bullshit, right? That's what they say. Uh, so through the through the future, the future eyes of two uh, uh, very different characters, uh, we look. We borrow the hindsight and look at our world right right now. And uh, with this, with their hindsight, we look quite ridiculous. Uh, we are hurting the future, our future, uh, without benefiting ourselves. I, I don't, uh, they know they don't think we are even selfish. They would be, people say, oh, we're selfish, we're doing all these things. But when they look at it from the, well, from the future, what, what do we get out of this? We're not getting anything out of this. We just can't stop ourselves from doing the same thing and same thing again. So Homo sapien is not really selfish, but we are really stupid. That's the, I think that's the conclusion. Uh, and all this might sound like a dead end so far, and I think my seven minutes almost up. And uh, and it does the story <coughs> does sound like it's reaching a dead end. And and I have I assure you, it's it's really against my principle to to contrive an, a happy ending uh, for the story. You know, I, I'm from Hong Kong. I'm not from Hollywood. So, uh, but when I r when I was writing the story, the ending somehow revealed itself. You know, I, I was surprised. I was surprised how, like, the, the life of a novel, once you've given it in enough uh, uh, momentum, it would, it, it would take over. And uh, when, I, when I discovered the ending, I was very surprised. I hope, I hope you would be surprised too. And, and I hope if you buy a copy of it, you, and you will find the discovery very enjoyable. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish you a good day tomorrow, not today. You know? James, thank you. So the next speaker is Lawrence Gray. Lawrence um, was a semi-finalist in 2012 with a short story collection, Odds and Sods. Lawrence, by the way, was founding president of the Hong Kong Writers Circle. So he, the short story collection contains classic and experimental short stories, but also an essay on Hong Kong's history. Or Lawrence. Okay. Right. I'm about to say exactly the same thing now. Um, right. <laughs> uh, the Odds and Sods collection took uh, 40 years to write, or perhaps a month spread over 40 years. There is, there is a 40-year-old story in there, and uh, others were written in spurts scattered over the past 20-odd years. Some of the stories are more short story-like than others, which fall into what I suppose can be called experimental or just mental. And it is all topped off by an essay on Hong Kong history called The End of Fiction, which is not a short story at all, but since it is about Hong Kong, it is pure fiction. Some of the stories are odd, some are about sods, and uh, one is called The Odds, and none of them are about turf in a lawn, hence the title. So quite a few of the stories were written as a dare, Someone dared me to write a story without punctuation. Another dared me to write a story with Thomas Pynchon and Clint Eastwood making an appearance, 
and another dared me to write something that got as many titles of Donnie Yen movies in there as possible. The more traditional ones were written by the Hong Kong for, were written for the Hong Kong Writers Circle's annual publication. As chairman, I was damned if I was going to spend so much time arranging the publication of members' writing without at least one piece from me in there. There had to be some perk in running the organisation, and that seemed about the only one. In short, I write short stories when people ask for short pieces. My bigger projects are scripts, and nowadays I try, against all odds, to make films often coming into contact with many people who I would stick in the sod category, I suppose. Uh, but I've spent a few years writing novels that uh, are so far unpublished, which is a third category of my existence called Bummer. Luckily, Proverse will be publishing one of these uh, novels uh, this year, Cop Show Heaven. So watch out for that. I do have others sulking with self-pity in the dark magnetic pits of my many hard drives. I might bring another one of those out to blink in the light of day, as I have discovered on reading my old writings that they have a certain charm that I have rarely seen exhibited elsewhere. Though I wish I was writing hardcore crime fiction rather than following my own quirky bent, as people buy those and those kind of things and uh, even propose indecent sexual adventures to the authors, despite TV and film doing it much better. Which brings me to the question of why I write prose fiction at all. Some people might point out that the audience is still there. Uh, people buy novels, though uh, any publisher will tell you that uh, they are more likely to buy celebrity cookbooks and travel guides. But uh, is the audience the reason why anyone writes at all? Writing prose fiction for money has always been a non sequitur since the day television turned from black and white only to colour, let alone the advent of the internet. Even Dr. Johnson, way back in the day of uh, London's 18th century literary Grub Street, complained that everybody writes but nobody reads. He also said anyone not writing for money was a fool, which does beg the question of why write at all. I have recently been clearing out the attic of my parents' home and removing all the boxes of writings that I did before I came to Hong Kong. I'm surprised to discover huge novels and large numbers of plays that I cannot even remember writing. I wrote them in longhand, typed them out with three carbon copies, and edited and rewrote them, and I have no idea which order the versions I am looking at go, which perhaps indicates further the futility of the endeavour. The amount of work I put into these without it registering in my memory goes to show how facile and throwaway the imagination is in one's twenties and thirties, and how strangely engaging the whole process must have been for me. Others meditate, sitting and repeating a supposedly mind-altering mantra, while I had to write many hundreds of thousands of words to get the same effect. Although nobody showed the slightest interest in any of this when I first wrote them, I find that they are not without interest to myself if no one else. They reek of the 70s and 80s, which makes me think maybe I should rescue them and uh, use them to write something about that time. There are good bits in them, and I only wish that I had met me now because I would have encouraged the young guy and stopped him from following too many creative paths. The works are far more wild jungle than tamed, well-kept garden. I would now be able to point out ways in which to harness the good choices and identify and eliminate bad choices, or at least the bits where one can see the mind trying to work out where to go and what to do. But would I even have listened to me? Despite my craving for success as a writer, it is obvious to me that the act of writing down my imagined world was far more important to me than packaging it all up in a manner accessible to a paying audience. And this is perhaps why I've turned to films, because the process is fascinating, very serendipitous, and full of adventure, while the chore of structuring written material that can find funding, if not an audience, uh, is much more palatable to me in script form than if I was uh, to churn out 100,000 words of page-turning commercial fiction. When I turn to prose, I really don't want to go there. And there seems little incentive to do so. So why Rose write prose when one can get the creative buzz in other ways? Well, for me, it is that I can explore more ex esoteric plots and structures. And most of all, I can play with words. Living in Hong Kong is uh, like living in a linguistic desert that rarely rains. I will even watch Top Gear for its use of the English language rather than the laddish obsession with, character, uh, with the characters of supercars. 
turning a good sentence, creating a nice simile, extending a curious metaphor, and delving into the nuances of time and subtleties of meaning are so much what the written language is for, above the visual te and technologically influenced circus of film and TV. Those have their own pleasure, which go beyond the tyranny of the words of the moment, and I can wax lyrical about signs and signifiers or just plain propagandist cracker barrel philosophizing of movies, but it is in the written word where one can be free, even if one is little read, or especially if one is little read. I write prose not so much to save the world or even to entertain it, but more to save myself. This attitude does, of course, drive me nuts. If anyone says such a thing in any of the classes on writing that I give, I show them the door, saying, go forth and write a diary, for here I am going to talk about how to write for an audience, though I always recommend t writing for television when I do so. And so my motives in writing prose are questionable. I write for myself in the hope that the self that is created is admired by others. Otherwise, I would not even be standing here. And there you have the idiocy and conceit of all creative narcissism. And uh, I am reminded uh, of what a friend of mine, who is now the art critic for the Daily Telegraph, which, considering he was a singer in a punk rock outfit with somewhat radical opinions, is another of the ironies of life. There is a huge difference between a book about madness and a book that is madness. I thought this deeply profound while I was writing Madness, but now I'm not so sure there is any difference. It is madness, like the turtles whose backs hold up the earth, all the way down. And on that note, uh, allow me to say with great subtlety, uh, buy the book. It's on the counter at the back and craves your attention, just as I do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And now, Birgit, oh no, it's not, I've messed up, Peter. Peter, it's your turn. <coughs> um, so Peter was joint winner in 2011. His novel is Article 109, a title that begs explanation, which I hope you're going to give us. Um, what, what we say is that it, it's a thriller, and it lifts the lid on Hong Kong's fragile status as an international financial center. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Gillian's kind of ruined it because the last thing I'm going to do is actually talk about what Article 109 is about. Um, uh, w what I will do, however, is um, talk about the process which led me to um, decide to write it and enter it uh, for the Proverse Prize. Um, Article 109 is a, is a legal thriller. And... Um, why did I write it? Well, simply, it comes down to my my love of reading. I um, have been reading uh, thrillers, uh, mystery novels, um, commercial fiction for um, for quite uh, some time, ever since I, I was a kid. Uh, to say, actually, to use the, the verb reading is, is wrong in what, what I do to them. I, I consume them. I devour them. Um, I, I can go through, you know, so many books a year. Um, I just absolutely love them. I'm, a, I'm actually, by daytime, I'm, I'm an insurance lawyer. Um, and um, just to give you an idea of, of how much reading has been the one constant in my life, um, I didn't have much of a plan when I got into that profession. Um, I read John Grisham's The Rainmaker and kind of thought, hey, insurance law, that sounds quite interesting. Um, 20 years on, uh, Mr. Grisham's got a lot to answer for, I can say. But what I can tell you is when I was at university, um, I um, obviously had to, you've got to study lots of exams for law and um, uh, one of the exams obviously you have to, st to study is criminal law. And I had a lot of trouble with the uh, McNaughton insanity defense. 
But if, you, if any of you are studying law, I would encourage you to read uh, Mr. Grisham's A Time to Kill because suddenly it all became clear. Um, I'm not sure if John Grisham is going to be on the reading list of a, any law school, but um, for that reason, he really should be. Um, I do love reading, yes, and um, especially thrillers. And what, what I found is that thriller novels have three key elements to them. And the first element is uh, the plot. That really is the most important thing. Uh, the plot is the mystery, the challenge that you set the hero. And um, the great writers uh, that, that I've read, um, they hook you with the plot from the very first page, the very first line, and they then reel you in. And they then layer on the tension with subplot after subplot, making you want to turn the pages, making you keep your eyes open, making you want to know what's happened. And it's like, almost like a, a piece of music that builds and builds until it reaches that great crescendo right at the end, that moment, that twist, where, which you didn't see coming. It's like a slap in the face. But that twist brings all the subplots together, and by the last page, you're, you, you're left completely satisfied when you read that last line. That satisfaction, however, lasts for a moment because it's replaced by a disappointment that you can't erase your memory and go back again to the beginning and start again. So the plot is the first thing of any uh, great thriller. The second element that any really good thriller should have is the characters, especially the main character, uh, the, the hero or the heroine. He or she must be someone that the reader can relate to, someone who's not perfect, someone who has uh, flaws in their character, uh, but somebody who has a very, very strong uh, moral compass, knows the difference between right and wrong. And that sense of right and wrong that the, that the main character has is the thing that is tested to the limit in uh, the plot of any uh, great thriller. And of course, we as human beings all have that within ourselves. And that's why we find in the main character someone to whom we can relate. And we find ourselves rooting for the main character throughout. The third element that any great thriller must have is the setting. The setting is vital. Um, either it, it reflects the corruption against which the hero is, is, is waging a lonely battle. Um, think of uh, uh, Los Angeles in the 1930s and the, the great Raymond Chandler novels which were written uh, against the background of, of that. Or the setting, it, it represents the value system which the, the hero is defending, sometimes with his life. Uh, think of um, Batman's Gotham City as an example. Either way, the setting, it, it's not just background. It is almost a character in its own right. The very fabric of the story, and it's the thing that really creates the tension. Now, I always thought that Hong Kong, of all places, would provide the backdrop, the perfect backdrop for a thriller. The, the, the contradictions that this city provides are, are providing an enduring fascination for, for people, I believe. You've got East versus West, communist, communism versus capitalism, one country, two systems. Uh, tension, ladies and gentlemen, is a necessary ingredient for any thriller. And in Hong Kong, right here, right now, you have ready-made tension. And yet, there have been so few thrillers written set against the backdrop of Hong Kong. And as a, as a reader, as an unashamed reader of that genre, I asked myself, why hasn't someone filled that gap? And then I saw an advert for the Proverse Prize, and why became, why don't I have a go? 
So I did. And Article 109, my legal thriller, um, was the result. And it reached the light of day as, as joint winner of the Provost Prize uh, in 2011. And that is really the opportunity which Proverse brings uh, budding authors. And having reached the light of day, um, it did quite well. It got to number one on uh, Dimmock's bestseller list in, in Hong Kong, um, which was quite pleasing. Um, but there was a problem once you've written one. It's a bit like reading, my addiction to reading. Once you've written one, you really can't stop. As soon as I'd finished that, I thought, I've got to have another go seeing what was happening in Hong Kong. It was almost, it was too tempting. So um, uh, my second one, which is a follow-up to Article 109, is, uh, is, being, is being published. Uh, I, I will say a word about what Article 109 is about. Um, Article 109 refers to Article 109 of uh, the Basic Law, which is that wonderful document that binds together that great contradiction of one country and two systems. And uh, Article 109 says that uh, the government must preserve Hong Kong as an international finance center. And anybody who has lived through the finance crisis of 2008 will know that no government can make that commitment. Um, do my books have the ingredients, those three crucial ingredients that I talked about? Well. I've tried, but I think it's up to the readers to make their own judgment. So if you do have the opportunity to read them, please do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Peter. And now we come to Birgit Linder, who's a poet. She was joint winner in 2013. I'm not going to say anything about her book. I'm going to let her t tell you everything herself. Very good. Thank you very much. Somehow I have a feeling uh, the poet is the boring one. <laughs> I could never write fiction. I should say, because I feel I don't have that kind of imagination of thinking forward to an end or something like that. <laughs> Hence, uh, that, uh, that summarizes my book. It's just poems. <laughs> and I suspect it's because when I look back and I think about my life story, I cannot make a story out of that yet. Uh, it's only moments, and it's those moments that I have collected in, in the book. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about that. Um, I think we all understand that uh, poetry is a bit of a marginalized genre. Um, and uh, as some literary theorists have said, lyrical writing is the least social of poetic forms because it is too self-reflexive and apolitical. Uh, or perhaps our world has become so crazed that we cannot read the kind of stuff that is deeply interfused, as Wordsworth said. On a smaller scale, all of us who read poetry look for lines and words that express what we feel or believe, hopefully with a fresh perspective. On a larger scale, many of us also believe that the task of poetry is in some way to reconcile us to our world and to allow us a measure of tenderness and grace with which to exist, and that therefore poetry's task is to reconcile us to the world. These are Shelley's words, not mine. <laughs> um, my world is a world of moves from culture to culture, of the loss of home and of roots, of the comings and goings of friends from all over the world, as well as of new places, new ideas, new challenges, insights, uh, new impulses, and it seems of a constant immersion in change and other otherness. And I think that probably in this room most of us uh, have that kind of an experience. Um, as someone who moved around the world, in the world by my own free will, I cannot claim to be an exile in any way. However, it is true that more often than not, living in another culture can create forms of inner exile. In addition, one's language is in exile. 
uh, especially for a writer, it can be frustrating not to belong to a distinctive linguistic group. And living in Hong Kong as a non-native speaker of either Cantonese or English, one is almost doomed as a poet. Um, if I were to write in German, I would not have an audience here where I live. But writing in English also limits me in many ways. And, and then how do I define myself? A German person writing poetry in English? An English language poet with grammar mistakes and occasional excursions into other languages? A multicultural poet with German characteristics? A world Englishes poet? I've spent some time thinking about it, but I could not come up with any definition. Um, so, but without a definition, what kind of a poet I am, am I, or what, what is my voice exactly? Um, I don't have a catchy word for it. I only have perhaps a little bit of an explanation. The, the title of my book is, uh, of the collection is Shadows in Deferment. Um, we all bring along shadows from the past, uh, from our own cultures, from the people we have lived with and grown with, and every place throws its shadows on us. We too cast our shadows on places and on people, and oftentimes we realize their existence much, much later. In the end, there is a balance between loss and gain, hopefully, and there are theories and faiths to account for that. I think that most of us here would agree that we are privileged and that this kind of homelessness can also be a fertile ground for an incredible richness of experience. Even though I chose to write in English, I find that my writing intended to overcome my own sense of alienation often acutely accentuated the gap between my life experiences and the lives lived by other people around me. At times, I have successfully inscribed myself into new spaces and cultures, and occasionally even identified profoundly with the social context in which I lived, repeatedly having to come to terms with geographic, cultural, and linguistic changes, and attempting to cope with the corollary sense of homelessness are just some of the issues of living abroad. Much of what we have brought with us is only recognizable over time, and what we experience today has yet to cast its deferred shadow. A friend of mine complained that my collection is difficult to pin down to one theme or style, and I won't argue with that. But perhaps, that is that, but perhaps it aptly reflects the experience of an unsettled life. Yet between the cultures, people, places, and experiences, something has come into existence in the language that is not my mother tongue. Rather than say that I'm a poet of this or that style or theme or group, maybe it's just that all these moments and encounters have become a creative trope that forms the background of my poetry. I'm not a romantic, and I don't lame, claim to my poetry being deeply infused, interfused, or that it could reconcile a reader to this world. I've read poems that had this effect on me, though I did not write anything this significant. However, writing poetry myself has allowed me to find grace and tenderness and some measure of reconciliation in my life. Uh, Auden once said that poetry makes nothing happen. That might be true when compared with more provocative fiction, but poetry simply has a different mission. It expresses feelings in a way that challenges us to think about the meaning of what we have felt. And hopefully, publishers like Provers and events like this will continue to highlight some of this personal and social meaning that we can find in poetry. And I'm definitely grateful that my poetry is part of that. Now, um, I, uh, I talked about this before, and I do think, to begin with, publishing poetry is awfully difficult to find a publisher. So I, I really am very, very grateful for, for this opportunity, um, especially as somebody who can't say I'm half this and half that. I'm just German, you know, <laughs> and living here. And <laughs> nobody's really interested in that, I assume. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I, it's great for me. I, I love the opportunity to be able to write in English and to publish in English, even if it's not my mother tongue. 
but in the meantime, since I have won the prize and published the book, I went back to Germany and I gave the books to my family and my good friends and so forth and I had a very strange experience. They all just looked at it and said, oh. <laughs> First O oh was for, I didn't know you're right. <laughs> and then I don't understand anything, you know, now it's in English. <laughs> and I worked so hard to find some type of audience and I was so proud to go back home and all the people so dear to my heart couldn't understand anything. And it was a very, still now I'm, I'm really very baffled and I'm thinking I need to translate and republish that in German so <laughs> that I feel a little bit home at home <laughs> and not just in Hong Kong as a poet. <laughs> so um, that's about uh, the book and then uh, Gillian allowed me to read one of my poems and I picked the very first poem of the book because I feel this is actually in lieu of a, a biography. This is simply about me and my life here. And the title of this poem is I Too Sing This Country. Um, this is of course uh, taken from Langston Hughes' poem, right? Um, it wakes me every hour on a strict schedule that moves to a regular rhythm Cadence, cadence, cadence. It rumbles on until I fall asleep again, and I dream of meters, of dissonances, and sudden enjambments. And I'm attacked by iambic feet, strangled by troaic lines, and sentenced to rattle on and on in this long distance train of thought. And Whitman is the captain. I toss and turn from grass to stars and back to myself. I cannot sleep for all I hear is Germany singing, America singing, China singing. Finally, when the sun almost rises and a nation finds its Cesura, I nod off and I dream of raisins, Niemandsrosen, and wild geese, until the train is once more deferred. A darkish man pulls the stops and shouts, listen up folks, I too sing this place and he sings a weary blues that assumes what I assume, and then he moves the train into cadences again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Birgit. Thank you very much to all the writers. Well done. So now, questions. We've had six writers, all very different, all with very interesting things to say. I hope you have lots of questions. Uh, this question is for James. Uh, he's the reason I'm here, of course. I, uh, you won't be very pleased about this question because I'm going to pigeonhole your work into a genre, so to speak. <laughs> yes, uh, you've taken up a theme which is quintessentially Western, may I say. Um, which is the post-apocalyptic, uh, you know, drama. Um, because in our mythology, we have the beginning of the earth, we don't have the end of the earth. And it's quite an astonishing choice for a Chinese uh, to take up that mm, storyline. So, and it's all the more uh, astonishing that you've given it a rather ambiguous or tragic, uh, whatever, and happy ending. <laughs> Because we don't have the begin at the end of the world in our mythology, in our collective uh, consciousness. So, uh, but you have it. So my question is: Now that you've written it, you don't think about your nationality when you write. Uh, otherwise, you've been in trouble, right? Uh, so now, now that you've written it in retrospect, is there anything that's Chinese that's come through uh, that would enrich the genre? If the genre is the right word. Yeah, you, have you been influenced by your own tradition? You're growing up in Hong Kong and such like. I don't know whether it's a fair question. <laughs> it's very unfair, I've not read it yet. Uh, all, all questions are fair. Well, you should buy a copy right now after this. Yeah. Uh, 
I well no it, it um, it's a, it's an interesting question because I I, uh, I part of it uh, well num number one I, I write everything bilingually I have this habit uh, if you go to my blog you see every single essay every single story including man's last song I write it concurrently in English and Chinese I find it most uh, inspiring because when I when I write for a few days, you know, sometimes I run out of gas. And uh, if I switch language, it shows me a different perspective. And, uh, and I discover that depending on the language I use, I see the exact same situation with different uh, views or, or, or try to get out of the situation through different means, which is, uh, I, I, I find that very, uh, I, I just learned that in, since I started writing. Uh, I don't agree with you that, uh, well, the end of the world is a Western th theme. I agree, Ap apocalyptic themes are very biblical, maybe. But th this is not, this is not uh, apocalyptic. There's no bangs, there's no flying dragons and so on. It, you know, you, you just drag out, everyone just get older and older and, you know, the less and less and less people until we go under critical mass. Uh, but, and, and plus, end of human beings is not the end of the world. Uh, that's very wrong because we've only been around, if it's Homo sapiens, 200,000 years. You stretch it, you know, like you stretch the biggest monkey and say, that's my ancestor. That, you know, you're talking about a couple of million years at most. We have nothing to do with the end of the world. If all people, like I say, if every single one of us die tomorrow, the world will still spin around the sun and spin around itself. Uh, I remember a long time ago, well, I started out as an environmental engineer. I came to Hong Kong U and gave a talk. The, um, and then I remember coming in, uh, and uh, at the time I was, uh, wow. But anyway, I'll stand up because I can see some of you are feeling impolite. You know, there's a policeman behind you, Julian. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, uh, so I, I came and I look at the, the, the poster. It's an it's a earth crying. Save me, you know. I look at it and I'm, you know, but people would call me cynical. But I come in, I, op I start to talk, I say, I look at that poster and I see no hope. Why? The earth doesn't need us saving. We are talking about a very anthropo and anthropocentric idea. We are wanting to save this ecosystem for our own purpose. If you want to save the earth, the earth says, oh, sorry, thank you. If, the, if all, every one of us die tomorrow and it's full of cockroaches, this planet will not be upset at all, you know? I don't think we will either because we're dead. But uh, so it's got nothing to the end of the world. I'm talking about the end of human race. It's got nothing to do with apocalypse un unless you believe in special traditional folklores, you know? Uh, so I don't know whether they answer your questions, but, you know, it's kind of... <laughs> the Chinese part, oh, the Chinese part, if I, I've been writing the, you know, well, I, I, since public uh, publishing this, I've been busy with all sorts of things. I'm very easily distracted. And uh, so I haven't, uh, but the Chinese version of it, even in the English version, there's a lot of discuss discussion on, uh, through a Taoist point of view. In fact, my, my, one of the main characters learned about Taoism from an old lady in Oxford, because if you grew up in Hong Kong, most people, most Chinese people probably would not know anything about Taoism. This is how good Hong Kong is, you know, this is like a, it's not, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, I say that because I, the first English book I read on Taoism was Alan Watts actually, so, you know, it inspired me to say this guy learned, uh, you know, it's very international, uh, and I think philosophy has no boundary. Uh, and something has, that has got to do with life and death, especially collect, ma collective life and death, you know, would, would fit into a lot of this uh, philosophical background and tradition. You know, I don't think there's any, you know, buy a book, you see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question and your answer. Any more questions? I mean, there must be many more questions. If not, I will ask Rebecca a question. <laughs> Rebecca, would you tell us how you got the idea for your plot? That's a very easy question. How, how did you know, the, the central situation 
Could you tell us how you found it? Because it's a very interesting story. Okay, well, probably makes some sense to explain a bit about the plot. Um, so um, my book focuses on a on a family, um, and this is sort of one of the themes that that families come in different shapes and sizes, and and um, just exactly what is the meaning of family and and how families come about. Um, so in my family, you have um, you have uh, four women and their children, and the children are all from the same father. Um, this is actually based on a on a loosely based, sorry for legal reasons, loosely based on a on a true story. Um, when my son was around six months old, we we travelled to Israel for um, for Independence Day, um, and uh, Independence Day in Israel is, is a big deal, and and uh, everybody heads outside, and and lots of outdoor parties, and and lots of celebration. Um, so we went to one of the the main parks in uh, Tel Aviv, and you know sat on the grass, and you have a picnic, and ended up. So um, just across from us, there was a, a huge family um, celebrating a picnic. Um, lots of women, lots of children, but no men. Um, and the, the women were obviously not related um, genetically, but the children obviously were. Um, the children were, were very, very similar, but I'm talking like 12, 13, 14 children, you know, really a lot of children. Um, so we, I'm... <laughs> people, are, I'm very curious about people. Um, so this really struck me as, um, as as different and unusual, and I couldn't work out where the connection was. Um, and then uh, 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 a middle-aged gentleman turned up, and all of the children greeted him like children greet their, their father. Um, and then it made sense. Um, Honestly, at first, it was my my first reaction was, "Wow, we have to we have to get out of here! Like we have to pick up my son and 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 just go." Um, and then afterwards, you know, it just I, it triggered something in me, and I and and I really thought, "What would it be like to to be one of those women? What makes women do that? What makes women choose this kind of um, um, a family to live in and and to raise children in?" And um, and then with it being Israel, you have the you know you have the um, the Jewish connection. Um, actually, I don't know if I, I told you this, Gillian. Um, that gentleman was recently uh, sentenced to many, many years in uh, in uh, prison in Israel. Um, he had not just four wives. He had many, 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 many women um, around Israel. And, uh, yeah, was recently done for, <laughs> um, for that. But, yeah, anyway, so that's. Um, I guess this is a question for all of you. Uh, how do you motivate yourselves to write? Or do you even need motivation? Or is it just something that comes naturally to you when you're trying to complete a novel or even start a novel? Um, I had to motivate myself to stop writing. Um, Literally, I just uh, I sat down for 20 years and gave myself very bad posture, and uh, I just typed on an old typewriter, which uh, fell apart. And literally, I have a wall full of these ramblings. Uh, some of them are uh, more coherent than others, uh, and it never really dawned upon me that one actually had to think before the starting the process. And it's only uh, it was o only a chance meeting with a uh, TV producer um, who who said, "Well, there's there's money to be made in writing TV series," and I was ignoring him because I thought he was complete idiots. Uh, and he turned out to be the head of drama at the BBC. Uh, and I thought, "Oh, uh, this is, I, you know, my state is desperate." Um, I turned to writing because I was unemployed, and I. It was easier to say to people I was a writer than unemployed after a few years, uh, and I could, you know, I and uh, I would have to have given myself a job then. In fact, I don't really uh, have jobs now, um, and and I just continued. I, I just continued writing, and and as soon as I got this idea, oh, TV, they actually employ people in TV, and they don't care who you are, 
um, or, or as long as you can actually turn up and do the script and just stand all the insults uh, uh, and the ignominy of being a writer for TV, uh, and you're that desperate that you'll take the pittance that they will give you, um, you can do it. Uh, and at that point, I thought, hmm, this, this is a business. And so it then became uh, a question of motivating myself to think before I started and to work out what they wanted and to sit down. Then it became a job, of course, and then it's even more tedious then. It's, uh, you know, you, cause most writers don't really want to be employed. They just want to sit and create and such like. Um, so it took me a, a long time to be able to stop myself from just doing that. And uh, now I, I kind of wish I could go back to that sort of period of ignorance where it was just the sheer um, energy of rattling away at the keys and banging something out and discovering something. Now I find that I have to talk it through, work out the plot, work out who's going to fund it and where it's going to go. Uh, and the, the whole process is, is really, um, you know, it's... it's it's dragging little bits out and nailing them onto the wall and testing it and testing that and testing the, this and the other. And, and it's, no, it's a process of design now rather than the, that writer, the thing that I thought writers did, which was just you let it float and it was a mystical experience uh, uh, and so, such like. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, if you, want motiv if you find it hard to motivate yourself... Um, Desperation is, is the most thing. So give up all work, give up all your social life, uh, lock yourself in a room, preferably um, in the most dismal, miserable, miserable place you can find, uh, cockroaches running around and crazy drunks uh, and so on, and uh, have nothing else to do but have a typewriter. And that quickly motivates you. It either motivates you to write or to get the hell out of it and, and do something else. Um, and if you can't do anything else, then, of course, you're stuck with the writing. I think that that's about the uh, the only thing I can say is if you can if you can do something else uh, and it's much more fun I do that because uh, I don't think um, there is such a thing as a career nowadays uh, if there, if there ever was and uh, I think most writers find themselves doing a bit of writing but a lot of teaching or uh, a lot of something else connected with the writing or, or they they work in advertising you know Joseph Hel Heller wrote uh, Catch-22, uh, it took him seven years, and all that time he had a full-time job as a, as a copywriter in, in an advertising company. So, and, and, and that's quite common, and uh, Franz Kafka, uh, most of his letters are full of him whinging about how miserable and boring his job in the, in the office is, and the, I, I can't remember what it was, insurance office or something? Insurance, insurance office. office. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you know, and I wish he could sell his books and get them published so he can go off and find women or something, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, the life is what it is. Um, you know, so if you want, if you've got feel you've got something to say, then you, that will motivate you. Uh, if you feel that it's it's some, I, I like I say, I, I and mine, I, I said it was. I thought it must have been some kind of spiritual process. It was to do with growing up or. or reprogramming my mind or, or something that that's what drove me to start writing and just wrote uh, and I think it was I found the process uh, somehow engaging because I can't think of any other reason why I wasted so many hours writing really unreadable stuff uh, and until it, you know it, I one got to a point where I can I can do what I think is readable nowadays, you know. You know. But uh, uh, it must have been some other reason rather than something to say, and, and it's taken me a long time to actually think, well, what about, uh, now that I've got a certain amount of skills and so on, uh, here, what can I use it to and what can I say with, it, with that? Uh, so I think, I think there's two sort of motivations there that, uh, that pe people have. It's either they've got something they have to say and communicate, or, or they've got some psychological, I don't know, pain or... or um, stupidity or whatever it is that that uh, that you need to work your way through uh, and get it out uh, and that's your process other people could maybe use dance or or um, they use performance or, or they build houses or they uh, paint or they do you know or they design clothes or or they work in insurance offices I mean, even that can be a creative spiritual experience if you know I'm, I'm sure that there are people who really enjoy that sort of work I think it's just something that you find 
uh, that's available to you, that you enjoy. And that you, in other words, you don't need motivation, it just happens somehow. Yeah, well. No, no, I ga <laughs> gave that up uh, years ago. Years ago, it's it's all computers uh, oh, yeah, now. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I'm 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 very heavily into technology, uh, and the the more technology, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I love gadgets, yeah. Yeah. which is why I do films. You know, which yeah. is heavily technological. Did you want to respond to yeah. that? Um, well, I guess. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I do work in an, an insurance office and the motivation for, for, for writing, I, I, I guess I spend my days bottling up the creativity and then when I come home in the evening, that's when it's unleashed. So um, obviously you do have, you do have the, and I think all of the, the authors would, would have those days where, which are harder than others, where you're sitting at the, 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 your laptop and it's, it's tough. It's not. It's not coming. But then you do have those days where you're really in the zone, as it were, like it's like a like a sport, and and it just comes very very fluidly. Um, I think uh, in terms of a no novel, I'd say that there's almost a a sixty percent threshold. That first sixty percent is 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 like the hard part here, yeah, because until you get to that stage, you're still not sure if you, you you've got a, a full novel, but once you get to that 60%, that's when the real obsession kicks in. You've got to finish it. And when you're not writing, when you're not sitting at your laptop, when you're doing something else, you're, you're really feeling guilty. And I'm, I'm sure you've all sort of experienced that. Uh, that and, and so it's almost like a, the motivation is almost like a negative thing at that point. You've got to do it and, until it's done. Um, you, you, you can't think about uh, anything else. Perhaps I should ask if anybody else has a question before we continue with the answers to right. Oh, I guess this question is a two-part question. Uh, the first part is quite at the risk of sounding very banal. Um, did you do I, any of you ever feel the need to pursue an agent? And um, in the larger question is kind of related to that, um, as writers living in Hong Kong, uh, what's been one thing that you found is very helpful to you in your career, both professionally and creatively, to live as a writer? Um, maybe not in your native country or outside of a place like London or Sydney or New York or something like that. Not to say you have to live in those cities, but I'm just curious, uh, building a life as a writer uh, here in Hong Kong. Okay, so, um, okay, this is, um, actually Hong Kong is my home. I've lived in Hong Kong for over um, 20 years. Um, I, <laughs> I guess it comes back to this uh, career as a writer. Um, I think probably, I mean, any writer given the chance w would quite happily give up their day job to, to write full time. I know I would. Um, but is it really, is it really doable, regardless of where we live? Uh, is it doable in in, um, in Hong Kong? I think I think very difficult. I think it comes down to market. No, you, you, you wh where the, the market is, and and the market for Hong uh, the market in Hong Kong for for English language books, let's say, um, is always going to be um, uh, reasonably um, limited. Um, but then saying that, I mean, w we live in a in a global world, right? And we have the um, we have the, the the internet to to spread and to. Um, I have to say, for me, I, I thought being a writer was was writing. You sit down, you write. Somebody publishes it, and then you know you li you live off the proceeds happily. Um, I, I didn't realize that that a, a book, a, a novel, poetry is a product. And, and if you you even if it's not a case of, of making money from it, but a w you want a wider audience to see it, you have to market that work. Um, uh, yeah, which is not something I, <laughs> I enjoy the writing part, the the selling yourself, the selling the the the, the flogging your work. Um, it's it's much more difficult. Um, to be honest, I'm I, I, I yeah sorry. 
Thank you very much. Rupert would, would, Rupert, would you like to say something about that? Because you're very, well, you're very active in the creative world. Um, I'm very active in writing. <laughs> uh, I, I won't say creative. I uh, do most of my writing in uh, as a translator. I translate uh, Western plays into Cantonese for staging uh, in Hong Kong. I translate uh, Chinese subtitles of Western operas for projection at uh, opera uh, shows. I translate English subtitles for Cantonese opera, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, well, to answer the earlier question, the motivation for writing or a creative writing is the prize. I won prizes. I started in primary school. I won the primary school section uh, <laughs> story writing. Then I won the secondary uh, school uh, story writing. And then uh, back in, it must be 1967, I think, when I was in the sixth form, I reread a novel I wrote. I thought it was a novel. I reread it and found that it was lousy. That the plot was lousy. Too many coincidences and so on and so forth. So since 1967, I stopped writing fiction, novel, or creative work, call it what you like, and concentrated on translating until I won another prize. <laughs> so uh, entering a competition and uh, were aiming for a prize is a very good motivation for writing. That's my only advice. Thank you very much. I th think there's no more time for any more formal questions and answers. But, but you'll be here, and the authors are here. And now I'll our I'll host is going to thank speak. Thank you, uh, Gillian. I'll just wrap up a few uh, comments, uh, advertisements. But, but first of all, I wanted to sincerely thank Gillian for bringing together uh, a really diverse yet engaging group of authors. So please, thanks to the authors and thanks to Gillian for making it happen. As I, as I said, we, we've had a fairly good relationship with Proverse uh, through Gillian and Verna, and they have both been speakers at our book club, but I can see that there's a whole other field that we can tap into for our future book talks, which, as I said earlier, we run about eight to ten a year, approximately every month. We take a break over summer. Um, and if you're not on our mailing list, please leave us your email at give it to Gary, that's Gary, who's over there, and he will take your details and ensure that you will learn about really interesting talks. Our next really interesting talk is on the 26th of March. It's a book called The Philosophy of Fearism and How Fear Drives Our Lives. Uh, it's actually the talk by the author himself, Desh Suba, um, and it should be a really interesting evening. So the 26th of March here. If you were on our mailing list, you would also know that we are currently having a book sale. Not these books, but we are <laughs> down upstairs on the third floor uh, today and tomorrow from 10 till 5. We are selling books, thousands of books, not these, okay? Uh, thousands of books. I think today we sold almost 6,000 books was my calculation. And they're all $20 each, no exceptions. So you can get an encyclopedia, you can get a graphic art book, you can get a little comic, but they're all $20 each. So come and visit us tomorrow and buy and bring your own bag or box and the exact change. Buy five, get one free. Buy five, get one free. He's, he's a great salesman. We, we really want to get rid of those books. It's uh, tomorrow will be the last day from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. Yeah, I suggest you come at 10 when the best stuff is there. So now you can buy slightly more expensive books. <laughs> and I think if you're very nice to the authors, they will sign them for only a small additional fee. So I hope to see you again. Thanks very much. Thank you very much again to the library, Mr. Sadorko. Thank you. Thank you.